Great. Well, today, thank you so much for joining us on this blustery day here. Hopefully you're staying warm and safe where you are. And we're going to talk a little bit about the 2023 CPT changes. My name is Susan Rohde, and I'm a senior manager in the healthcare division at Ide Bailey. And as of last October, I have been here 21 years. My focus is on physician coding, and especially within that documentation, and I will hand it over to Rachel. Hi, everyone. I'm Rachel Pugliano. I am also a senior manager here at Ide Bailey. I haven't been here quite as long as Susan has. <laughs> I'm going to be coming up on my five-year anniversary um, here in January. So I work in um, the revenue cycle services area, focusing uh, primarily on the mid-cycle of the revenue cycle related to charge masters, charge capture, um, and those processes around that mid-cycle space. Thank you, Rachel. And we will hear from Rachel a little later on in the presentation, but I'm going to kick it off here. So there were 393 total changes with 225 of those being new codes, 75 deleted, 93 revised, 70 category three codes were added, 70 PLA codes were also added. The medicine service section did receive the most additions with 38, and those do include some new vaccination codes. And there was really only one new code for the ENM section. However, that had the greatest amount of regulation and documentation changes. You, you know, we cannot cover every single change that has taken place. So we do highly suggest you go through your CPT coding changes book, or if you don't have that, actually go through the CPT book that the AMA puts out. And as you go through these changes, we recommend including clinicians that these changes are going to affect, providers, clinical personnel, coding, billing staff, compliance, charge masters, every anyone you can think of that these will impact. And you're going to want to make sure your charge master and your fee schedule are updated with these new codes, as well as any electronic health record preferences that you have. If you have drop down boxes that automatically give providers codes, we're going to want to make sure that those are updated. We know how our providers like their favorites. We want to make sure they're still intact and update our charge tickets, both electronic and paper. We're also at the very end, Rachel's going to touch on some of the physician fee schedule final highlight rules. And there's some good ones in here. The split shared under E&M, some telehealth, chronic pain management, behavioral health services, or that BHI, which is a hot button dental and oral health, skin substitutions, audiologists, and then that colorectal cancer screening. Uh, that is going to be in the second half. What I can tell you right now is CMS continues to not recognize subspecialties, which is a difference from the AMA, CPT, which does. Uh, but CMS did modify how it's going to distinguish between an initial service, one where a patient has not received any professional services from that provider or a qualified healthcare provider within that same specialty who belongs to the same group practice. So be on the lookout for that. Let's talk a little bit about the 2023 E&M guideline revisions. So we know in 2021, the 95 and the 97 guidelines had a major overhaul but it only pertains to those clinic visits. Well, now it's going to be across the board, which is wonderful if you were a coder trying to code both and you'd have to take off one hat to do the clinic, put on another hat to do the EDs or the OBS or the inpatients. Well, these e &M revisions, these are really intended to simplify coding and documentation requirements, both for the healthcare providers and improve patient health under the following principles. It's going to decrease that administrative burden. That was why the 2021 guidelines were actually titled the Patients Over Paperwork Initiative. We want our providers to simply be able to see patients and not worry if they're hitting all the bullet points in order to assign a certain code. The AMA and CMS did agree with this. They seem to think this is going to decrease the need for audits. I'm not understanding 100% their thought process on this because we still will need to be auditing records, but it should decrease the need and it will make them much simpler because now we have MDM or time as opposed to 
history exam medical decision making. We want to decrease the unnecessary documentation that's not needed for patient care. This all boils down to medical necessity. And if you've ever heard me speak in your life, you know I always touch on medical necessity. And we want to ensure that payment for these ENMs are resource based and that there's no direct goal for payment redistrib redistribution between different specialties. So touching on that, when we talk about documentation, it really is important that we let our providers know that we need complete documentation to support both that diagnosis and that procedural code that's going out on the claim form. And within that, there really is specificity. We know that we have the new MDM grid that came out in 2021. A key to good documentation there is getting some of those specific adjectives in our documentation. Chronic, acute, stable. That way we leave nothing to interpretation. As coders, we can pick the correct code. And if that chart ever is reviewed, we leave nothing open to interpretation for that CMS reviewer because it clearly states, yep, this is an acute condition. When it comes to diagnosis coding, of course, we, we have ICD-10, which is so specific. If you're old enough to remember ICD-9, if you had knee pain, there was just one code. Now with ICD-10, we drill down even to laterality. So we have a different code for right knee pain as opposed to left knee pain. So again, if we have those drop down boxes within our EMR, we are going to wanna make sure that those are updated. We wanna educate our providers and our staff, and we wanna make sure that there's teamwork and they work together. We wanna stay away from uh, unspecified codes and remember that each code set is updated every year. And when we're talking about specificity within diagnosis codes, this was touched on a little bit at the symposium. The documentation in order to assign an ICD-10 code has to show that that condition was monitored, evaluated, assessed, and treated, or meet. Maybe at your organization, you use tamper, treatment, assessment, monitor, plan, evaluate, referral. That's quite a bit longer, so we like to stick to meet. We cannot just assign a ICD-10 code because it's in the problem list or the past medical history. We really do need to show that it was monitored, evaluated, assessed, and treated. And I chose three of the most common diagnoses that we see to talk just briefly about how we can show meat in the documentation. When it comes to asthma, if the provider simply says asthma, we assign J45909. It's an unspecified asthma code. When really every time we're documenting asthma, our providers should be stating, what's the cause? Is it exercise induced? Is it cough variant? Is it related to smoking? I should see the severity. Is it mild, moderate? Is it severe? And any of those temporal factors, acute, chronic, intermittent, persistent, et cetera. I should just not see asthma. We want the payer to know the severity of our patients. And if we're simply just saying asthma, we're not really painting the full picture. The same goes for diabetes. At minimum, I should see if it's type one or if it's type two. What complications is the patient having? Are they having any eye complications, any ulcers, any wounds, et cetera? And what's the treatment? Are they on insulin? And if they are, is it injected? Is it oral, et cetera? And last but not least is everyone I'm sure is COVID fatigued, but COVID-19. We're gonna use that U071 as the principal diagnosis when it meets the coding criteria. And then we're gonna code any of the associated manifestations like more than likely that pneumonia. Uh, certain codes do still need to be sequenced first. We have to follow ICD-10 coding guidelines, such as those OB codes, sepsis, transplant communications. We want to code, code signs and symptoms unless, <clears throat> excuse me, my kids brought home a virus, unless uh, there's a definitive diagnosis. And we don't want to assign U072 as that's not valid in the United States yet. As you know, we're on ICD-10. Other countries are on ICD-11, 12, 13. We're just lagging a little bit behind. So U072 is not valid in the United States. 
And I just love this statistics because I'm kind of a survey statistics uh, lover there. But 50% of the physician's day is spent on, and that should say EHR, not her, but we know how autocorrect is, is spent on EHR and desk work. 37% of the visit time with patients is non-clinical tasks. So we have our providers doing one to two hours of extra work each day. And that can include time before and after uh, clinic visits, at night, if they're at home entering into the EHR, we call that pajama time. That is crazy. So these new EM documentation guidelines that were in effect 2021 that are being transferred over to the other subsections within EM, really what they're trying to do is get rid of this note bloat. Prior to the EHR, when Medicare would request records, they would get a paragraph. After the EHR, with the advent of templates and auto population and macros, these same records they were requesting would be 10, 11, 12 pages long. And if you know anything about Medicare and other payers, they're not all about that extra work. They do not want to be shuffling through 12 pages to get to the part about the amoxicillin you prescribed for their pink eye. So we know providers are responsible for note creation, but that note really does affect other departments throughout the day. We know that notes are the source of important decisions, obviously, so they really should be think, thought of as cross-functional. We have the EHR department, and maybe at your facility you don't have a whole department, but you have someone that specializes in the EHR, like a super user. This might be your person putting your templates together. They, they don't have a direct effect on the patient, but they really do with the provider because if we have a template that's lengthy and includes a bunch of information that the, isn't really pertinent to that visit or that patient for that particular data service, then we don't need that. And that is contributing to this note bloat. When we talk about our CDI department or clinical documentation integrity department, this department, if they are looking through 12, 13, 14 pages of notes, then they're spending extra time that they could be doing something else. If notes aren't submitted to them in a timely manner because the physician's taking too long to complete them because they're putting in non-medically necessary information, then the CDI review process is affected that way. And then these slowdowns, these can directly affect our accounts receivable or our AR. And of course, we know that we don't code you know, necessarily for payment, but I'm sure at your facility, AR is valued and important and is discussed with you. When it comes to the billing department, the codes identified in the notes, they can affect what the coders assign and then thus in turn what the billers bill. Notes that are copy and pasted day after day with little change, despite the patient being stable, that increases your risk of inappropriate billing, audits, denials. That's what the new guidelines are taking away. There is no longer a need for copy and paste or client hand and clone documentation or even templates because now we only need that medically appropriate history and exam. And then the compliance is obviously is the facility and the physicians putting themselves at risk. Notes can definitely uncover some compliance gaps and areas that need a little bit of your extra attention. And the time that a clinician is spending looking at a computer screen or completing or reading notes, that's time that they're taking from being face-to-face -face and giving good patient care. As coders, we know the time that we're spending reviewing notes, that affects our accuracy, our productivity, et cetera. And patients need their care teams to be there for them. I think we all can agree on that from the moment they walk in the door until the moment they go out to the mailbox and get that bill. We touched briefly on medical necessity, but again, it would not be a presentation that I give if I didn't hit the, hit the definition home hard. These are not my eloquent words. These are CMSs, but medical necessity really is the overarching criteria for payment in addition to individual requirements of the CPT code. So basically what medical necessity is, is quality over quantity. CMS, Medicare, they want to see what was medically necessary for that patient for that particular data service. And these new e &M revisions really help with that because we got rid of all the fluff and the note bloat. And all we really need to see documented now is that medically appropriate history, the medically appropriate exam, and that medical decision making. 
As far as the changes go to the sets, we know that the observation codes were deleted. We no longer have that discharge, that admin, or those subsequent days. We know that the inpatient, those guidelines were definitely changed. The guidelines for the ED codes were changed. And then the revision of the MDM grid to support the changes, especially in the emergency department, was updated. The next two slides just show all of the changes that became effective January 1st of 2023. Um, and with the current guidelines, you know, there was a split between the office visits and the ED ops inpatient. Finally, in 2023, we're just going to be using one guidance and it couldn't come any quicker, especially for you professional coders that were trying to do it all. <clears throat> when we break down the subsets, we discussed just a second ago that those observation care codes, they were deleted. We no longer have the 217 for the discharge, the 218 through 220 for the admit, and the 224 through 226 for the subsequent. Because they were added in, that verbiage was added into the inpatient codes. For example, 99221, which was the low level initial inpatient admission, now states initial hospital inpatient or observation care. It has a low level medical decision making and it has a time associated with it of 40 minutes. Now, if we are using time to select these particular codes, it is a minimum. 40 minutes has to be met. This isn't like a typical time code in CPT where only the halfway threshold has to be met. 40 minutes must be met or exceeded. In all my travels, in all my reviews, I have found that medical decision making is easier to meet than time because when you're dealing with patients, especially ones you've seen for several years, you aren't spending as much time getting to know them, getting to know their history, et cetera. So meeting that medical decision making is often easier than meeting the time. We still have those providers though that feel like they need to put time in all of their notes. Even if you're coding on time, there is still medical necessity. If CMS comes out and reviews your charts and you have 40 minutes for a ear infection and you assign the level five, the documentation won't support that medical necessity. So now observation and inpatient are the same code set. You might be wondering, because this came up several times at the symposium, well, how are the payers going to know the difference? Well, on that 1500 form, they're going to know the difference because the place of service is going to be different. 22 for your OBS, 21 for your inpatient. Here's just a little snippet of what 99221 looked like in 2022, as opposed to 2023. The verbiage in blue is what was changed or deleted, et cetera. Well, in this case, this was added. The rest of the stuff was changed. It's now for inpatient or observation. It requires that medically appropriate history and or exam, which is up to your provider. It's provider subjective. And that straightforward or low level medical decision making. If you're going to use time, it's total time on the date of that encounter. And it's a minimum of 40 minutes. <clears throat> As for the subsequent daily visits, same same um, thing there. According to CPT, what the CMS and AMA is both seeing is a lot of what they call clustering. And that's just assigning 99232 for all of the days on your hospital visit. I know a lot of you probably have that one provider who's like, you know what, I'm only going to code 99232 because it's safe, right? It's not low, it's not high, it's just middle of the road. We need to be assigning codes based on the documentation. And if we look at the definitions in the CPT book, 99231 is when a patient's stable, recovering, or improving. 99232 is really for if a patient is report, responding inadequately to therapy or they developed a minor complication. So if you're assigning that code every single day the patient's in the hospital, that would show that that patient is not getting better or responding inadequately to therapy. And then 99233, the patient's developed a significant complication or new problem. If you're giving details in your history or your provider is giving details saying, um, worsening, uncontrolled, stable, improving, that can really help your coder choose the appropriate subsequent daily visit code. Also, if a payer comes in to review a chart, 
again, you leave no room for interpretation that this is the correct code that was assigned. When we talk about medical necessity in these subsequent visits, of course, Medicare uh, saw that clustering and said absolutely not, and they are running comparative billing reports, which is exactly what it sounds like. They can come into your facility, run a report to see how many times you're assigning certain codes, compare it to the billing of other facilities of the same type, and let you know if you're an outlier. They did this in 2019, and as you can see, they found an improper payment rate of over $621 million that they projected were improper Medicare payments for subsequent hospital visits. As far as initial versus subsequent, the AMA is saying, again, that the initial service is when the patient has, has not received any professional services within the past three years from that provider or anyone in that specialty. Now the AMA, they recognize subspecialties. So if you were looking at this from a CMS and CMS does not. So if you're looking at this from a CMS point of view and you're thinking provider or one of that same specialty, it can't be a subspecialty. It would still be an established patient if it were. When we talk about inpatient and observation again, we deleted all the observation codes, we rolled them into the inpatient codes, and then we have that set for admit and discharge on the same day, 99234 through 99236. That still remains the same. And again, we have different rules for AMA CPT as for CMS. For CMS, you have to have been in at least eight hours to assign these codes. For AMA, they don't put a time limit on it. One thing that is mind blowing, especially if you've been a coder for any length of time, is the new verbiage that the AMA, again, CMS is not agreeing with this, but that the AMA put out about admission from another site. And we don't know what other payers are gonna do. This is going to be very payer specific. You're going to have to check with your payers. It's always been, if the same provider saw the patient, say in the clinic or the ED, and then they also admitted them, you would only assign the admit code on that data service. Now, AMA is saying, if the same provider sees the patient in the ED, and then that same provider admits them, as long as the documentation supports it, they can assign both codes. We've always been able to assign a code for ad, uh, discharge from inpatient, admit to SNF. Now. AMA and CPT is saying if it's the same provider seeing a patient in any of the outside sources from another site, they can also assign that admit code. Again, the documentation has to be there to support it, and CMS has not signed off on this, so it's going to be very payer specific. If I was a betting woman, I would say most payers are going to follow Medicare, but uh, I have definitely been wrong before. And this is the actual verbiage from the CPT book notifying you that you need to put that modifier 25 to the other e &M service, the one that's not the admin. And here's just a little grid showing you the codes and the times that go with each. And remember, time is a minimum. It is not the halfway threshold for these inpatient and observation hospital care codes. As far as the nursing facility guidelines go, if you are using medical decision-making to choose your nursing facility code, the number and complexity of problems addressed at the encounter is definitely one of the determinations. They did come up with some verbiage. They're not going to put it in the MDM grid because they don't want it to confuse everyone. It's only for nursing facility codes. And it states multiple morbidities requiring intensive management. So this can be a set of conditions, a set of problems, syndromes that are likely to require frequent medication changes or other treatment changes or reevaluations. The patient's at significant risk of worsening, either medically or behaviorally, 
and they have risk for a readmission to the hospital. Again, this verbiage is not in the MDM grid on that first bucket because it only pertains to nursing facility. And I am sure a lot of you have providers out there that are seeing patients in the nursing facility that have multiple morbidities that require intensive management. These are the new codes right from the CPT book. You'll see the initial codes. We now have straightforward or low level MDM, moderate level MDM, high level MDM. These codes also have time that are associated with them. And it is also, again, the minimum time. These are not halfway threshold codes. CPT did put this verbiage in the book, which is interesting because they usually don't cross over into CMS territory but they do state regulations pertaining to the care of nursing facility residents govern the nature and minimum frequency of assessments and visits. These regulations also govern who can perform the initial comprehensive visit. We know that CMS has their own requirements regarding how often nursing facility residents need to be seen and who can perform that initial comprehensive visit. Now CPT is letting everybody know that they're not in charge of this and other agencies are. Again, new guidance under the nursing facility is regarding multiple ENM services performed by the same physician or other qualified healthcare professional. It's consistent with the hospital services that we talked about. Again, historically CMS has said, hey, you can charge a discharge from the inpatient and an admin to the SNF or the swing bed on the same day of service. CMS did propose to not allow that to happen. And the final rule said, yep, yeah, you can still do it. So they did not win in that particular uh, situation. When we talk about home or resident services, nothing was really changed here except a little bit of verbiage that now says home or resident services. The same, the codes are right there. 99343 was deleted. And I apologize uh, that we have to go through these quite quickly because there was so many changes, but you all should get the slide deck. And if you have any questions, you can feel free to reach out. For the emergency department guidelines, again, the 95-97 guidelines were updated in 2021. These changes rolled over to the ED in 2023. The most important thing to remember about emergency department coding, you cannot code based on time. There's absolutely no way that you would be able to capture the time that the provider is spending with each patient. So the joint CPT and RUC group, the ENM work group decided no time strictly being coded based off medical decision making. There's no distinction made between new and established patients in the ED, so we don't need to worry about that. And again, we're only going to go based on medical decision making. We are not going to use time. We still have our three buckets when it comes to medical decision making, uh, the presenting problem, the amount or complexity of the data, that's labs, x-rays reviewed, looking at old records, and then that table of risk. The actual concept of MDM does not apply to 99281, that low level ED code. Therefore, that code does not even require the presence of an MD. Now we need that medically appropriate history or exam, and that is determined by the provider. And of course, we still need to show that medical necessity at each visit within our documentation. New coding rules, medical decision-making is going to determine your visit level and you need a, a medically appropriate history and exam. And that is up to your provider to determine if that was indeed a medically appropriate history and exam for that visit. There's no longer a distinction in the MDM grid under that first bucket for additional workup plan, and you no longer get points if it's a new problem to that examiner. These 2023 requ requirements make it less numeric and more qualitative, including terms such as acute, acute illness with systemic symptoms, chronic illness with severe exacerbation. Under that second bucket, this really did get the most changes in clarification, which it definitely needed. Now we have points ordered for review of prior external notes and the use of an independent historian. I want to tell you now that a translator is not an independent historian. 
And then under that third bucket, that table of risk, some important changes there under the moderate level, we now have social determinants of health, which we did have last year as well, but it was not being utilized as much as it should. And then prescription drug management considerations. And under high on that table of risk, now we have decision regarding hospitalization or escalation of care. All right, when we talk about the medical decision-making grid, some of the changes include the instructions were moved, so they come actually before the definitions. They added parentally controlled substances and decision to escalate level of care to that high MDM. They removed the clinical examples that they worked so hard to come up with under the table of risk. They created two new, new conditions in that first bucket, acute uncomplicated illness or injury requiring hospital level care and stable acute illness. They modified some of those chronic conditions and they reinforced that the independent historian does not include translation and management or documentation substantiates that risk level. They also put a new paragraph under the general guidelines of the MDM table that some of these situations only apply to certain settings. Obviously the decision to hospitalize applies to outpatient or nursing facility encounters, as if you're already in the hospital, it wouldn't apply there. Whereas the decision to escalate hospital level of care applies once you're already in the hospital, if you are escalated to say the ICU level. Prolonged services, there was quite a lot of changes there, but most notably, it is worth mentioning that this is on the OIG radar as CMS thought this would be the exception to the rule that it would be very rare for prolonged care service codes to be assigned when in actuality, when they were shown the frequency, they are assigned quite often. So now they are being looked at by the OIG. And if you're bored and have some time, here's the actual report number. 99418 was a code created to align with 99417 except this is for the observation or inpatient setting. Once again, AMA CPT is saying you can start the 15 minutes at the low level time of the threshold, whereas CMS doesn't really agree with that. Since there is only one code or one time associated with these codes, they came up with this neat little grid that helps you shows you the required time, the prolonged service start time, and the time beyond that in order to assign those codes. Again, if you have questions on these, please email me after 99356 and 99357. These are the counterparts to 354 and 355. They were revised in 2021 when we, when we got 99417 and G2212. These codes are to cover the total time spent by a physician at the patient's bedside, as well as on the patient's floor or unit in the hospital or nursing facility that exceed the time threshold of the primary code. And again, these codes 358 and 359 are prolonged service that's provided on a date other than the face-to-face -face visit. When we get into the actual CPT surgical codes under pain management, two codes did have verbiage added to report imaging separately. And then facet joint injection clarifications now regarding guidance on how to count the injections. Are you going to count them per joint? Yes not per the number of nerves. And there is bilateral instructions. There are two grids in your book that totally are handy. This is the first one shows when image guidance is accepted and when it is not. And then the next grid shows when you should use modifier 50 and when you should not. I am going to warn you again, CPT and AMA use of modifier 50 on these codes differs than CMS, so you are gonna to have to check the NCD LCDs for Medicare when you are trying to code bilateral injections. For surgical surgery, or sur neurosurgery, excuse me, 22857 is the parent code for total disc arthroplasty. And if you do an additional level, it's 22860. If you do an additional level on top of that, it's an unlisted code because both the AMA and CMS does not think it would be necessary to do two or more, therefore they're telling you to use the unlisted. 
The parenthetical notes were revised for the arthrodesis, and it's important to note that a segment is a single vertebral level. We now have code 63052 and 053 for depression, decompression that's performed when you're doing a posterior inner body fusion. These codes can only be used with the posterior inner body fusion codes, not the other arthrodesis codes. And now we have these awesome pictures in the book, which I've been waiting for many years. And these pictures really do help show you segments, uh, facets, all of that good stuff. For hernia repairs for anterior abdominal hernia, they changed the verbiage to state it doesn't matter the approach, it can be open or it could be laparoscopic. They put a great table in the book to show you initial recurrent, reducible, incarcerated, and the codes that you should use. And for percutaneous nephrolithotomy, we have 50080 for stones that are two centimeters or smaller. 55081 are for larger than two centimeters if they're branching or you have stones in multiple locations. You're going to want to read the notes there very carefully. For cardiology, we had a couple new codes added 33900 through 33904. These are to show revascularization if you're using a stent, not if you're using a balloon angioplasty. We're still going to use the 9000 level codes for those. And pulmonary angiography, we have some new codes to di differentiate now between angiography and venography of the pulmonary arteries, which always makes me giggle because the ve pulmonary veins would be a venography and not an angiography. Um, the SNI codes are still included in these. Uh, endoscopic bariatric device procedures, we have new codes for 32290 and 291. We have some new codes for the drug delivery system and for the laparoscopic simple subtotal prostatectomy. Thank you, Susan. Well, we're probably gonna have to kind of fly through some of the rest of this. I just wanna reiterate too that um, we can't possibly cover every single code change that's happening this year, but we're trying to get as much in in the 60 minutes that we have. So I'm gonna share my screen here. And we're gonna move into some of these more non-surgical type areas and also cover some of those AMA changes um, that Susan alluded to earlier in the presentation. So getting into chronic pain. Uh, so we've got the um, chronic pain management codes that really um, cover some of these new G codes like the G3002 and G3003. Here, let me get that slide up for you. So CMS created these two new G codes uh, for bundled monthly chronic pain management services. These include a person-centered care plan, health literacy counseling, and administrative pain rating scales. And this initial visit must be face-to-face. -face. Subsequent visits are allowed to be delivered via telehealth. Beneficiaries who have previously been diagnosed with chronic pain and those diagnosed during the visits are both eligible. And these TPM codes would be billed monthly and they can be billed along with chronic care management, transitional care management, and behavioral health integration, which we'll also be talking about in these slides today. However, when we're building both of those things, we cannot be double counting the time. So when this, these services are delivered, we need to make sure that we're documenting time appropriately and accounting for the time for the various services that we're providing, up to the patient, providing to the patients. So this bundle of services includes these items I've listed here. Um, I'll let you go ahead and you'll have this slide to, to reference, um, but you'll wanna make sure that you if, you, if this is a service that you're providing at your organization, be sure to read through some of these you know, coverage details and what is um, provided for these types of services. All right, so then with the telehealth, we'll kind of get into this section here. So CMS finalized adding 54 additional services to the telehealth service list on a category three basis. And they are guaranteeing their inclusion through at least 2023. Telephone EM visits were not included. So just wanna make note of that. Uh, the agency also added three prolonged service codes and two pain management codes to the permanent list for telehealth services. And the complete list is posted on the CMS website. Um, CMS codified several telehealth flexibilities 
that were extended for 151 days past the PHE. So that's just something that, um, sorry, I need to advance that slide there. That was just something that I wanted to make note of under this Consolidation and Appropriations Act. So basically what that's going to do is that these provisions will remain in place for 151 days after the PHE ends. So that's just something to make sure that you um, just keep a pulse on when we start hearing about the possible end of the PHE and uh, calculating these number of days. I think it'll be pretty well publicized and we'll get a lot of information when this is happening so that we can make sure we know when these deadlines arrive. And we can make sure that we're you know, following this, this information and know when these things might change. Um, so this is really, really to try to, um, you know, when we're transferring out of the PHE, they're wanting to try to make that transition as flexible and as user-friendly as possible. We'll see if they're able to accomplish that. Um, so like I said, this will allow these telehealth services to remain in place for 151 days. The services can be furnished in any geographical area or any originating site. It allows certain services to be furnished via audio only. And it also allows for the PT, OT, and speed pathologists and audiologists to furnish these telehealth services. All right, so then we'll wanna get into some of these, uh, the, the virtual provision and remote monitoring codes. So they revised the definition for the direct supervision. Um, so this includes the virtual ability of the supervising physician or the practitioner using that interactive audiovisual real-time communications technology. The policy is going to continue through the end of the year in which the PHE ends. So if the PHE were to end in 2023, this provision would continue through the end of 2023. And then when it comes to the remote therapeutic monitoring piece, CMS is going to continue to use the existing codes that were created in 2022. I think there was some, some discussion about possibly uh, having some new or different codes, but they wanna consider the broader remote therapeutic monitoring landscape. I think they wanna see how much are these really utilized in what context are they utilized before they make any future decisions when it comes to these codes. So for the behavioral health services section, this is the, the area where we're really looking at what are licensed professional counselors and licensed marriage and family therapists able to bill. So CMS is allowing instant to behavioral health services to be furnished under general, as opposed to direct supervision. The new G code for these services is G0323 for the behavioral health integration performed by a clinical psychologist or clinical social workers with mental health services as the focal point. So the creation of this code is to account for that monthly care provided by CPs and clinical social workers when that focal point of care is that integration piece. The psychiatric diagnostic evaluation can serve as that initial visit for the service. And CMS removed the uh, restricted procedure status indicated for family psychotherapy services. So there's some more flexibilities there. Um, and then auxiliary personnel may furnish those service, may furnish services primarily for the diagnosis and treatment of a mental health or substance abuse use disorder under the general supervision of the physician or NPP. So make sure that when you're providing these types of services that you just look very carefully at the guidance on what CMS covers versus what they don't cover when it comes to these types of um, services and also who is providing the services and what they're allowed to bill for. So there's some prolonged psychotherapy service codes as well that were deleted from the ENM section. And prolonged service are, services codes are no longer reported alongside with the psychotherapy code. So there is parenthetical, parenthetical notes in the CPT section for codes 90833, 836, and 838 that I would highly uh, recommend reading through to dive more into the details of, of these particular codes. And you know, understanding the type and level of ENM, how that's selected based on the medical decision making, the time spent on activities, um, the time note that may be used as the basis for an ENM selection and prolonged service may not be reported when psychotherapy with an ENM are reported. So there's some things that 
really need to be looked at and watched there when both of those types of services are being provided to a patient. Then here's just a, a brief slide to just give some additional code information on the caregiver behavior management training. I know that these might be a little bit difficult to read, but we've got code 96202 and 96203. And then the cognitive behavioral therapy monitoring, that's 98975 for the setup in the patient education. And then we've got specific codes depending on the type of monitoring that's been performed, whether it's for the respiratory system, the musculoskeletal or cognitive. So you'll wanna make note of those. And then the remote therapeutic monitoring treatment management codes noted on that prior slide. So just a brief um, update on vaccinations. So COVID-19 vaccines, the payment rate for the administration remains at $40. And surprising to me, there are actually eight vaccine products out there. I think that most of us probably work with maybe two, maybe a maximum of three different products, but there are actually codes for eight products. And they, they expanded the code set from five administration categories to 12. And there's codes added for the third dose the boost versus the booster dose. And per the AMA, the, the third dose code is really utilized for adults that receive that additional dose because they might be immunocompromised. And in those cases, it would be considered that third dose and it would not be considered a booster. So I just include an example here of that coding structure um, for the, you would have the type of vaccine product that was, that was given to the patient. And then that administration, it's going to be one, two, or three, or it, it will be the booster. And I did include the link here for the AMA resources because that appendix really does lay out all of the vaccine products very well. And it correlates on which HICPIX code or which CPT code you're going to want to use for the administration and which, which dosage. All right, so getting into some other services here quickly. So we have radiology. There's two codes now for the percutaneous AV fistula creation. Uh, there's the single access code 36836, and there's the, the two access site, which is 36837. These are designed for the upper extremity only. If this is performed on a lower extremity, we're still gonna use the unlisted code. I did go ahead and list the two most common systems that you would probably see documented by the provider when this is being performed. The ellipsis is the most common system for the single access and the wavelength system is the most common for the two access sites. So those might be some key indicators or some key words to pick up on uh, when, you're, when you're taking a look at some of those notes. Um, the angio cannot be reported separately. There are a lot of exclusionary parentheticals for this section, so I highly encourage you to look through those if this is a, an exam that you perform at your facility. Also want to make note of nerve ultrasounds. There's a new code for the evaluation of the entire course of the nerve in the extremity. So we still have the code for the focused evaluation, and that's still 76882. And now 76883 is when it's that entire course evaluation and you would not report both of these codes together. And then the single photon emission computerized tomography, commonly known as SPECT, the uh, four codes there have been revised. And the goal there was to clarify the intention of the codes. There really isn't any change in the intention, but they felt there needed to be some clarification. So they added the word acquisition to better differentiate between 78831 and 78832 where acquisition is really referring to the uh, separately obtained image with different radiopharmaceuticals. Under ophthalmology, we've got some, some codes that have been revised, the transluminal dilation of aqueous outflow canal. Uh, these have been revised to include the term canaloplasty to align with FDA terminology. And then we've got a revised code for orthoptic training it's, be, it's actually been revised to be a parent code, and they created a new child code. So 92065 is specifically utilized by the physician or the QHP. 92066 is going to be reported when this is performed under the supervision of a physician or the qualified healthcare provider. 
Code revisions also are in place for retinal imaging, the dark ad adaptation eye exam, and quantitative pupillometry services. That was kind of a mouthful there. And otolaryngology, we've got energy-based repair of the nasal valve collapse. This is a radio frequency treatment, and they created a new code 30469. This has historically been reported with an unlisted code. So if this is something you've been performing at your organization, you now have a code for this particular service. Transcutaneous passive implant temp temporal bone. There's new code 69728 to 69730. And the distinction between the codes is based on the location, whether it's inside or outside of the mastoid. 69726 is reported for the entire removal of the implant. All right, so a couple things that we wanna get into regarding the uh, final rule, some highlights here. So the, the uh, PFS conversion factor for 2023 is $33.06. It's a 4.48% decrease from 2022, but it's slightly higher than what was proposed. So I guess that, you know, kind of take that um, from both directions there, but this decline overall is due to the statutorily required budget neutrality adjustment, um, an expiring temporary adjustment to mitigate the impact of previous coding changes, and they're trying to maintain that 0% update factor. Uh, CMS finalized several significant policy changes in revaluating, revaluing remaining ENM codes, and they're trying to continue that four-year phase in uh, clinical labor pricing delaying changes to redefine the substantive portion of the split pair, split shared visit. You know, so, so some things there that are all kind of playing a part um, with this. So speaking of the split shared services, Susan really kind of talked about this um, a little bit earlier, but the main thing to note is that there has been a year long delay um, for finalizing the split shared guidance. And so the substantive Substantive portion is comprised of any of the following elements, the history, the performance of the physical exam, the medical decision-making piece, and then the spending of time, more than half of the total time spent by the practitioner who is actually billing for this service. So again, we've got this delay um, for 2024 to make any significant changes here. So we're just gonna kind of maintain the status quo at this particular time. Uh, so the clinicians who furnish the split shared visit will continue to have the choice of the above elements that are described in this slide. A couple of things here with the, um, the dental piece. So CMS clarified existing coverage policies for dental services. And historically, there's been pretty limited coverage for dental. But now, they're now these patients are covered when it's integral to the patient's treatment of a medical condition. So dental exams and treatments prior to an organ transplant, for example, or a valve replacement, or if they have um, treatment coming for uh, head and neck types of cancers. So there's some changes there in that coverage, which will be, of course, I think, welcome for the patients. And then CMS has proposed a change to the terminology for skin substitutes to, to be now be called wound care management products. And they are going to be making these supplies incident to the procedure starting in January of 2024. Um, they have held off on that, I think, because they want to hold this virtual town hall. They said it's going to take place in early 2023. They want to obtain feedback and comments before they make uh, those changes that they're planning to make for 2024. So the audiologist piece here, uh, they're now allowing direct access without an order from a physician or QHP for patients to receive these services from an audiologist. And there is a modifier they expect to be appended on the CPT code, CPT code. it's the AB modifier. They decided to go with this rather than uh, developing or requiring a new or different type of HIPPIX code. And so the audiologist would just continue to use the codes that are already in place, which are there's approximately 36 codes that audiologists typically use. So they would just apply this modifier when that patient has, has directly accessed them for their services. And these services are, are typically allowed once every 12 months for the beneficiary. And then CMS finalized two updates to expand coverage 
for colorectal cancer screenings. And they did that in order to align with the US Preventive Service Task Force recommendations. So they changed that um, minimum age for a Medicare covered cancer screening from 50 years old to 45 years old. And then they also expanded the definition to include a complete screening where a follow-on colonoscopy after a non-invasive stool-based screening returns a positive result. So that would be, you know, like the cola guard that I know we all see um, different advertisements for. So one thing I want to know, and and you'll want to definitely check with your other payers, your other um, your non-Medicare type payers. You want to check with those coverage guidelines and those payer policies to see if they are following what Medicare is doing or if they have different guidance in place. We know that not always every commercial payer will follow what Medicare's guidance is, is covering. And because that age of 45 can definitely, um, it changes your population a little bit. So you might be seeing a lot more patients that have a commercial coverage versus Medicare in some of these instances. So definitely take a look at your biggest payers and see what their coverage policies are for these colorectal cancer screenings. So that brings us kind of to our wrap up here. So what you should do with all of this information, well, I think the first thing is go through all of these changes in their entirety so that you can really understand what impacts your organization and where do you need to take this information? What individuals need to be, be a part of that conversation? Schedule meetings with those clinical departments, inform them of the changes, determine which services are they providing, which codes are gonna be changing that affect these services, what services are they going to start performing? Do we need to set up new codes in the charge master? Maybe there's some preference lists that need to be updated for the providers, order entry systems, all of those systems that are interconnected and that play a part in uh, your organization's revenue cycle. You wanna make sure that all of those things are updated and that education is provided to the clinicians and to the users so that they can be aware of all these changes um, that affect their, their departments and the organization as a whole. Please reach out to us with any questions. I know we're right at the top of the hour. We went through a lot of information in a very quick period of time. So please reach out to us. Um, we'll try to answer any questions that are in the chat and get back to you as soon as possible. And we really appreciate all of you being on this webinar today and spending this time with us and have a great rest of your day.